The title of this talk is, or this discussion, is the use of multiple adaptive networks as a crisis response. And this came out of our work in, in SOAS ACE, which is we are tasked to look at um, feasible and effective anti-corruption strategies in, in developing countries. And one of the things that we find in a lot of the uh, attempts at improving governance in developing countries and to improve anti-corruption is that a lot of these programs or approaches fail because we don't ask what are the incentives and the capabilities of insiders to engage in this peer group monitoring and to provide the information, not only the information on which um, enforcement can be based, but also have the capacity and the voice to engage in some of this enforcement themselves. In other words, unless information and enforcement are both at play, governance improvements don't happen. So this is a very fundamental observation of our whole approach to anti-corruption. From that perspective, we find that a lot of conventional policy responses and delivery systems fail because of a, a broad governance problem, which often has a corruption component to it. So sometimes these governance problems are simply that policymakers don't understand the nature of the problem they're trying to solve. But often the problem is that the policy is good in theory, but when you try to implement it, you find that the resources are captured by various players who take the resources and not, don't deliver what is supposed to be delivered, or they don't deliver the expected levels of effort and initiative. And so it becomes a kind of, um, you, you pump in resources, but you don't get the outcomes you want. In each case, the problem is that for the governance to work, you need to have a feedback loop, which generates information about what's going wrong, but also creates incentives to act on it by actors who have the incentive and the capacity to act. And this is a really difficult problem. It sounds simple, but when, once you start thinking about it, you find that a lot of conventional ways of thinking about governance reform and anti-corruption don't work in developing countries because the characteristic feature of developing countries is that they have a weak rule of law, which means that as a system, the top-down enforcement, which you take for granted often in advanced countries where when you identify wrongdoing or you identify evidence which says something should happen, you can rely on enforcement mechanisms and, and um, systems which will enforce certain rules. This is absolutely not the case in developing countries to varying extents, ranging from very fragile countries, and Jonathan will talk a little bit about that, to even the kind of relatively well-working developing countries, that loop is very weak. So unless you also ask yourself, who is going to enforce this policy or this um, uh, use this information, then your attempts at um, governance or anti-corruption don't work. So that's the, the, the brief background. Now, when the COVID-19 pandemic hit us last year, we look, started looking at some of the health systems in our uh, uh, the countries we work in. And the initial concern that we had was that given that these health systems were already stretched, were already very poorly organized. Internal governance um, structures were very weak. They would, I mean, the, the fear was that they would have catastrophic failures. And the fear was that they would not be able to respond to this crisis at the scale and with the efficiency that was um, required. And indeed, in many cases, the outcomes were extremely poor. But the really interesting thing is that the outcomes in, in many other cases were not as poor as uh, many of us feared. Um, so there was a whole host of things that needed to be done from treatment initially, track and tracing, organizing um, information dissemination about social distancing, organizing lockdowns, and finally, organizing vaccinations. And what we find is that different developing countries had different levels of performance in these um, things, but they were not all equally bad in everything. And so we started looking at what was working and why. And we found that the, the, there were some patterns in the bits of the system that were working better. So what were those patterns? And this is what we want to um, um, share with you because actually those um, patterns have some implications which go beyond the pandemic response and might help us to rethink how we think about 
um, systems organization um, for improved governance in, in developing countries. So this research is at a very early stage. A lot of information uh, is still has to be collected, but we wanted to share with you some approaches at this very initial phase. So we know that health systems are very centralized and for good reason. Health systems are centralized because you want to have coordination between different parts of the health system. And a lot of these bits are interdependent. And so in every country, you find that the bulk of the health, um, it, 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 I'm talking about developing countries, is provided by very centralized public sector health delivery systems with the private sector and so on operating um, uh, um, side, side by side with that. This centralization is both necessary, but also has well-known costs. And the costs are that particularly in context of poor um, rule of law and poor governance, the monitoring of flows from the top down into this vast you know, pyramid of um, activities, which is the health system, has always been very weak. And in most developing countries, that has been organized with a lot of informal transactions, which you can call corruption, and sometimes it's just not corruption, but informality. A lot of problems are solved informally. So when you start pumping massive amounts of resources into this really fragile and informally organized badly controlled system, you are likely to get catastrophic outcomes. Now, that big shock came with the COVID-19 pandemic. And the interesting thing is that the response was not linear. A bad and fragile system did not completely collapse in every case. There were many counter movements which emerged spontaneously with innovative health sector individuals, entrepreneurs, NGOs, concerned bureaucrats and politicians popping up spontaneously because they had a strong incentives to find solutions. And, and here is where we find this pattern that what we find is that parallel to this centralized system, new play players were mobilized ranging from community organizations, pharmaceutical companies, private hospitals and clinics, often with the payments organized by the public sector, but the initiatives happening in these um, private or NGO or, or um, social um, sectors. This did result in well-known problems of coordination and corruption did spike, but it also had a positive effect. And we are looking at the positive side of it now. And then we need to think about how we design this reform going forward. The positive side was that by unleashing multiple pathways for delivering things or acquiring things like vaccinations or medicines, and I'm we're not talking about it uniformly, but in those pockets that worked in the countries we looked at, and we can give some examples in the Q&A later on if you, if you are interested. We found that by allowing these multiple networks to mobilize, a number of things happened. It generated information about what was working and to what extent, but it also created checks and balances between these parallel um, systems because there was a kind of friendly competition between them. And those that peer group monitoring that actually we can deliver this cheaper than the state or the state public saying actually it turns out that we can do it better that check and balance had a remarkable effect in not only generating information but acting upon it and this is the really missing thing often in developing country governance no one acts on the information because they don't have the incentive to act on the information so just to round that up the the model where it worked and so it worked, for example, in, in Mumbai's big slum, Dharavi, there was a very good effective response to track and trace and monitoring. And it worked very well in uh, Bangladesh's acquisition of vaccinations. Um, and, and we can talk about a number of such examples, but there were a few conditions which made this work when it did work. The first condition was that you have to have more than one potential delivery agent with the capability to deliver. So there has to be a minimum you know, multiplicity of capabilities. So this is not the case in every context, even within the same country. So it only works where that condition is met. Secondly, there has to be some degree of coordination and feedback so that there is a coordinating body which is looking at these multiple um, deliveries and saying, actually, this is not working and that is working. And that coordinating body must have the incentive to do that. Now, in a pandemic, there's a very strong incentive to do that because the prime minister or, or different levels of the health authority are under pressure to deliver. And so that coordination happens. And this is a really strong learning 
that we have to identify the appropriate level of coordination where these different mechanisms can be assessed and then scaled up or scaled down. The third observation is that there was redundancy built in by definition, but this redundancy, that is you are trying different things at the same time, actually was less costly than the alternative. And to, to make it less costly than the alternative, obviously the redundancy had to begin on a small scale. If you try to do the whole system on, in multiple ways, obviously that would not work. That kind of redundancy would cripple any um, um, uh, uh, you know, fiscal system. So the redundancy worked because it started on a small scale and then it was scaled up. The bits that were scaled up were the ones that worked. So those three conditions were essential in this adaptive, flexible um, response system. And finally, I, I want to end with a couple of observations before handing over to um, Jonathan. The first observation is that the least cost and most effective delivery system is not defined by who can procure at the lowest price and who has the lowest unit costs in terms of salaries. The least cost and most effective delivery system, as we all know, depends fundamentally on the internal governance of that system. In other words, if the governance is, is good and you are managing your delivery properly, then that is the least cost system most often, not that I am cutting my costs because I'm underpaying people or getting the cheapest contracts. Um, there are examples of this with the EU versus UK contracting on vaccinations, we won't go there. The second observation is that the um, implicit competition between these multiple delivery systems was extremely beneficial in triggering socially desirable behavior. Now we often think of you know, how to constrain public actors by removing or reducing their discretion because we are always worried that if they have discretion, they will do some bad things and often they do. But this is an example whereby creating discretion but controlling it with this lateral competition, you actually generated a lot of pro-society or pro-social behavior. And this was really interesting to see even amongst um, players who are often very grasping and, and corrupt and so on, there was a competition to actually deliver. And, and not everywhere, I, I repeat, in some pockets. But this is something we need to pick up and, and, and develop in the future. And finally, the final point is corruption did not go down by any means. There were many factors pushing corruption up during this pandemic, but the improvements of governance meant that the corruption was contained and you had better outcomes in sectors where this multiple adaptive system could um, work. So here is the challenge that we are throwing out. We think that the elements that we have observed in the bits of the pandemic response that worked in developing countries actually show us a, a template for thinking in the future about how to reform these systems. And how should we, should we reform these systems? There has been a debate in the past between, in a period in the 1980s when we said the state doesn't work, let's just have NGOs delivering things. And then we came back and said, no, the, the, we need to have the state, but we need to fix the state with good governance. Neither of these approaches have been very effective because good governance could not convert these countries rapidly into rule of law countries. And obviously having a very disaggregated and um, NGO driven system doesn't work. So what we are, are, are finding is that there is a different route forward perhaps which is to have coordination at the center of the public delivery system and have multiple adaptive systems on a small scale experimenting and competing amongst themselves to show effectiveness. And then you scale that up, but you don't scale that up or scale it down permanently. It should be a continuous process of adaptation and experimentation. And I think this is the big learning from the pandemic. I'll stop here because I, I think Others have really interesting things to add to this story. So thank you, Pallavi. Thank you very much, Mushtaq and Pallavi and Ace for inviting me to, to, to speak into this framework that I think is uh, incredibly important at this time. I think these learnings um, and the ability to formalize them as you're doing now is extremely important for health responses to pandemics, but also other health crises. And, um, you know, I come at this, as, as Mushtaq referred to, as someone who works and has been working for, for 20 years in fragile places. Uh, you know, most of the ACE program itself, the countries are on the OECD fragile context list. And so 
there's a lot of complementarity in terms of what uh, you're focused on and, and what I see as, uh, you know, really quite innovative in the work that you're doing. And um, I think from a top line perspective, the most important contribution that this framework makes is it provides a set of anti-corruption solutions, but in a way that doesn't inhibit, but in fact actually advances some of the other key operating imperatives that you need in a health response. Namely, it promotes a resilient approach, uh, an adaptive approach, as Mushtaq mentioned, and also a scaling approach. And so what I'd like to do is uh, say three things about the, the anti-corruption solutions that I see in this framework. And, and then three things about how these anti-corruption solutions do promote adaptive management, resilience, and scalable solutions. So that this entire package becomes for me very, very elegant. Um, and it kind of sets the bar really in terms of how other types of anti-corruption work needs to proceed in the sense that you see a lot of anti-corruption work trying to limit and control and become very rigid, uh, reduce discretion uh, in performance, but that comes at a great cost of then, you know, limiting experimentation and flexibility, which is so important in emergency responses and longer term engagements in fragile places. So the three, uh, the three anti-corruption solutions that I see in this framework, um, I'll set them out and I think they build on uh, some of Mushtaq's uh, points, obviously. The first is this sort of weeding out framework. And, and what I should say first is that what's fascinating for me is that a lot of all of these different contributions of the framework, they all uh, hinge on this notion of redundant capacities that, that Mushtaq referred to, right? Having multiple different partners assigned uh, at the outset to perform a similar set of tasks. And through that process, uh, you get a lot of different outcomes. The first one is this anti-corruption outcome about weeding out, which is allowing through the process of invitation, it to become clear who the high performers are, who are actually delivering on health outcomes and who are the lower performers. And in terms of lower performers, on one level, um, they're probably low performers because they have very limited capacities, assets, human resources. But there's another essence here of, um, they could also be low performance because they're not really in the business of high performance. They're actually coming to uh, this with a sort of a rent seeking mindset. This framework to sort of pad contracts, find leakages, et cetera. And uh, this framework, this redundant capacities, this competition as Mushtaq referred to it, uh, kind of weeds that out, sort of disincentivizes them and also evaluates them. So that's the one piece. The other piece is what I call sort of a disciplining uh, measure or, or function here, which is to say that you probably have some really high performing uh, or high capacitated partners, but who are doing corruption, uh, who are opting for, for operations in the health sector for private gain. And when they enter uh, this framework, this horizontal network, as, as you've called it, um, they see pretty quickly that this is a competitive piece and that they need to move above board to actually deliver on these efficiencies and, and produce effective outcomes. And so they're disciplined in this way. Now that the caution of caveat here, of course, is that how do you maintain high performing partners that have been predisposed to corruption in the past, right? And this gets to some of Mushtaq's points about needing that political pressure of the prime minister's office, some kind of urgency from a political level to really sustain this kind of network, at least in you know, medium to short term. And uh, you also need these checks and balances of other partners in the system being able to pay attention to what these other folks are doing. And you need some kind of community mechanisms as well to really monitor what's impact, uh, what impact is being had on the ground. So there's a constellation here that you wanna continually build into the framework. So I think it's very important to have this, this sort of disciplining function in a way that sustains itself. And the last piece is perhaps the most interesting for me, uh, the last measure of, of anti-corruption that this model introduces, which I call the enabling function. And I think one of the most important contributions of ACE's work more broadly in the anti-corruption space is to recognize that there are firms and other kinds of uh, implementing partners that would, under other circumstances, choose not to be doing corruption. They actually want to be working in legitimate ways, but there are such barriers to markets or particular sectors like health that they really have to use corrupt measures to kind of pay their way uh, into functionality or survival ship. Uh, so in the case of the health sector, you might have entities that are low performing because they have to pay 
uh, bribes in order to get permits and licenses to keep functioning. They have to pay bribes at the ports and the customs to get access to equipment and, and, and other goods and supplies. And they have to then make ends meet uh, by potentially extracting informal payments from users of the health system so that, you know, in, in the process of paying out rents, they've got to you know, make the ends meet. And so um, when these types of partners are allowed to enter the horizontal framework with its fast track mechanisms for bureaucratic permit licensing, more streamlined approaches for procurement, which we would imagine in, in a kind of a highly uh, politically supported type of uh, framework or network, they then become uh, able or enabled to act uh, with more effectiveness and efficiency. And there's also an element here where those lower capacity partners could be brought in and supported by higher performing partners in terms of capacity mentoring coaching in a way where they're also um, being able to function as backup capacities. And, and Mushtaq made a great point here. You couldn't sustain redundancy over a very long period of time because it could be very uh, crippling or expensive for the system. So the competitive aspect about who's doing what and who's, you know, the one that allows you to see the higher performers versus the lower performers over time will phase out because you've identified the core group of partners that implement well. But you probably want to have some of the redundancy, which the pap your papers also mention, as the backup capacities. And these lower performers, by helping enable them and strengthen them and reduce their need for corruption, could be these fundamental backup capacities. Right? And this is a contribution for those firms, an incentive structure, but it also widens the capacity of the health sector itself. Right? And we can think of a place like the DRC last year, where they simultaneously had to deal with COVID-19, a cholera epidemic, Ebola, uh, and a national measles outbreak. There's so only so many high performers or relatively high performers in a system like that, you need these backup capacities. So overall, I think these are three really innovative ways to try to tackle corruption within the model or the framework that you proposed. And what I wanna say now is just how I think this model enables as opposed to tracks from more adaptive, resilient and scalable solutions as well. Because you can't have anti-corruption measures again that undercut other key imperatives for a health response. So the first one, as, as Mushtaq alluded to as well, is this adaptive component, right? So it's very hard to know at the, at the outset what the right solution is in a place. You have a technical set of solutions that you know uh, you need to do contact tracing, for example, lockdowns, et cetera. But how you do that in very different political, economic, and social contexts is not apparent from the outset. So you need to have some kind of experimentation. And these redundant capacities allow you to do that. So in the process of being able to identify high and low performers, part of the criteria for evaluating higher performance is, can these groups with their own capacities adapt to the situation? Can they find the right model in a way that's almost like a Rubik's cube? Can we take the technical approach and align it to the political, social, and economic um, configuration that you need to actually make it work? So it promotes this adaptation. Uh, and this is, of course, uh, for many in the adaptive community, something that they often see as a kind of a strange bedfellow with anti-corruption measures, right? Which really try to have an ex-ante preconceived solution and then create linearity and predictability so that they can control every step of the process. So what this model does is it provides a way to be adaptive, to find out what's working and, and, and how to build that up or scale it, but also in a way that advances anti-corruption. So I think that's very, very important. The other piece that contributes is on the resilience front. When you have backup redundant capacities, you build the resilience of the, the health system itself. Right? And this is a, a still a very new way of thinking in the industry. Right? If you were to look back five years at health system strengthening in fragile states, they would take an approach that says, you know, let's look at each World Health Organization building block of the health system and try and strengthen those capacities for supply, service delivery, leadership and governance. But recently you've seen USAID uh, and other major donors trying to advance a resilient health systems approach. USAID last year issued a, a grant of $250 million to create resilient health systems in fragile places, which is trying to find this sort of um, redundancy approach. How do you maintain system operations during crises in a way that when your frontline uh, health providers are compromised or overwhelmed, you have backup capacities. So this 
uh, framework contributes to this new line of thinking and in ways that bring anti-corruption into it, which you don't often see in this approach, right? Anti-corruption, there's been a few papers, including from ACE, that notes that anti-corruption isn't really talked about in the health sector in the way it is, say, in the economic sector. So this brings into focus a way in which you can do anti-corruption in a way that promotes resilience as well. And as you know, Palavi, I'm particularly fond of the argument uh, that, that Mushtaq um, articulated that sometimes when we talk about resilience, we talk about it as creating excess capacity, and that seems to be at loggerheads with efficiency. But in fact, uh, your arguments are that you need resilience in the system to promote efficiency because it looks, uh, there's an efficient solution that looks efficient until the wind blows it over, right? So this is a very important contribution as well, making the efficiency argument for resilience. And lastly, what this model does is it really promotes a new way of thinking about scaling as well. There's a very antiquated notion of scaling right now in the aid industry that, that sets up this notion that you have to do a pilot project, often a very small one somewhere. And if that works, then you scale it. And we're you know, increasingly trying to move away from this and towards this idea of outcomes-based scaling. The idea that you're promoting an outcome like health, like anti-corruption, like resilience, and you're allowing multiple scaling partners to work in this kind of scaling consortium or horizontal network, as you called it, in a way that allows you to see variation what's working where, who's working and where. And from there, scale up what's really working and scale down what's not working. And so we've seen a little bit of this in the health system. So there's that USA created this approach called the wave sequence and slice approach, where you basically start doing primary health interventions at scale. So you have multiple partners spreading across a sub-region or even a country, and they're all trying to implement a package of, of services. And through that process, you begin to see what's working and what's not. And you begin to learn and be sort of adaptive in the sense that this region is particularly good at creating uh, this solution. Why aren't the others? And in this process, uh, this wave sequence approach, they actually rotate high performers to the low performers to coach them. So there's a bit of proof of concept here um, beyond some of the examples that build on the examples that Mushak has from India and Bangladesh in places like Gaza and Afghanistan and Uganda that show um, you know, a way in which high performers in your framework could support lower performers and build them into the system. But again, with this anti-corruption lens that doesn't exist quite yet in, in some of these other models. So that's very important as well. So I think overall, um, this provides, again, I think a very elegant uh, and, and important solution. The hat trick, of course, is going to be, as Mushtaq referred, so the ability to create uh, coordination mechanisms that will bring the state in, the Ministry of Health, and a series of partners in ways that are very attentive to not only the scaling challenge of operationally uh, building out and financing solutions, but look at the anti-corruption elements, look at the adaptive and uh, iterative elements as well. Right? And we've seen some examples of FCDO doing this kind of complex coordination work in Nepal, for example, with economic transformation initiative there, or in the Pearl program in Nigeria, where they are looking at very politically savvy, adaptive ways of doing complex work in, in, in economic development. We need to take that kind of same spirit and set of precedent uh, into this approach to say it can be done, it's being done in other sectors, and use it to uh, have an entity that can deliver on scaling, but also ensure political authorization, co-creation, feedback mechanisms, and the like. So this will be, I think, an important uh, next phase in terms of how we build support for this. Thank you, thank you, Jonathan. And you know, Mushtaq and Jonathan, you you really set it up so well that I can so that I can lead it into the next part of the discussion, which is really uh, exploring, you know, in a sense, how can we bottle up these learnings uh, uh, from this this framework on crisis response? Uh, you know, the broader learnings, the broader intuition of this framework of scaling. Uh, which is really about scaling for revealed competencies, building resilience, and in the process uh, emerges an efficient, relatively non-corrupt outcome. And uh, you know, one of the sectors that the anti-corruption evidence program in, in SOAS has done a lot of work on is the electricity sector. And it actually got us thinking, hang on a minute, are there aspects, as I said, you know, within the broader intuition of the framework, are there aspects of which that can actually be transferable uh, 
to the electricity sector. And you know, obviously at first here, this jump to the electricity sector might, might sound like a huge stress, uh, stretch because you know, there's the health sector here and there's the electricity sector here. What possible commonality could we see? But there are some broad mechanisms which might, might actually work. And uh, just to give a, a brief sort of headline of how the electricity sector works across many developing uh, countries, uh, the enforcement of rules in centralized electricity delivery systems is weak and can result in, in poor outcomes. Uh, so as in the health sector, the focus tends to be solely on procurement rules or, or it tends to be on let's just enforce the contracts, never mind whether there is uh, the capacity to enforce or the incentive indeed to, uh, 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 to stick to the rules. And obviously it doesn't work very well in the context where the rule of law is weak. So it is no well-kept secret that the electricity sector in countries like Lebanon, like Nigeria, where ACE has done a lot of work, or even Bangladesh, is politically captured. But specifically in, in the context of Lebanon and Nigeria, we also see that it's politically captured to the extent that any reform of the national grid within the short to medium term is actually not possible. And we are also looking at almost uh, levels of crises, certainly in Lebanon to a lesser extent, but also true of Nigeria of undersupply, uh, to the extent that uh, you know those countries' productive capabilities are actually hugely constrained because electricity supply is 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 so sclerotic and electricity is so undersupplied. Um, so what we are suggesting is taking a step back and in scaling down. Uh, from the grid down to local networks. Now, the recent literature on decentralization has suggested that decentralization might lead to uh, you know, greater amounts of rent seeking. And that's probably true in the sense, in, in the case of administrative decentralization, but, but like with health, it might just be the opposite in the case of electricity generation and supply. So downscaling to local networks using disaggregated decentralized mechanisms, uh, sometimes involving efficient but informal arrangements is possibly the way forward in the short term. The challenge is, of course, to see how these informal arrangements can be formalized and contextualized and scaled to be deployed in other settings. But it's a way of thinking very differently of responding to an electricity supply challenge, which can't have a more a sort of immediate response like we do in health, but is certainly you know, on a more achievable scale than looking at the entire grid and saying, how do we improve transmission, then distribution, and all the political nature of capture that takes place from, from end to end. Success here, of course, depends on a combination of a, a few factors. It, you know, we have to discover ways of attracting efficient investors to sustain competitive checks and balances. The, the, the whole system of com competition to sustain checks and balances is as important here so that you keep prices under control. That's very important to keep rent seeking under control. That's the whole competitive element. And in, in electricity, it's very key that ensuring technologies are also environmentally the least damaging. And this is in context of weak rule of law. And when we're talking about the context of weak rule of law, we're also meaning a uh, high risk for investors. So essentially what we are talking about here is not the physical delivery mechanism. That's not, that's not the, the, the rapid scaling that we are talking about. What we are talking about are different de-risking strategies, different contractual mechanisms across segments of users within a country that can be scaled as required. In Nigeria, we worked with small and medium enterprises in what used to be the beating heart of Nigerian manufacturing in, in the Aba region in the Southeast of Nigeria. And it actually turns out that there is what we call willingness to pay. Uh, consumers who were once forced to be corrupt, once they realize that there is a technologically efficient mechanism which provides them uh, uh, electricity at an optimal uh, uh, tariff for them, no longer want to be corrupt. This you know, creates a virtuous cycle where, wherein you get an investor who sees uh, the, the willingness to pay as, as, so as proof for investing in that locality. And these, these uh, investors tend to be uh, more nimble, more technologically capable because they're coming in with uh, either solar. And in the case of Nigeria, because it's really more a gas economy than an oil economy, we're looking at CNG not green, as green as your, your solar or wind-based technologies, but there is a lot of gas, there is a lot of demand. The country really needs to speed up in terms of productivity and manufacturing growth. So, you know, CNG, uh, small 20 megawatt plants, which are supplying to SME clusters actually becomes a very efficient way. Now, of course, there's a critical difference in that in the, in the power sector, is, it is too expensive to have uh, too much redundancy, you know, whereas in the supply of health services, supply is hardly uh, likely to outpace, outpace demand. But of course, there's some technical redundancy required in, in power systems too. 
but the appropriate analogy here is slightly different. Um, in sectors like power, investments are lumpy and checks and balances have to be created by designing different delivery mechanisms. That's, that's what we are talking about. So different contract designs, checks and balances need to be simultaneously attempted to identify effective designs that work in that particular local context. So you test. This is working in a particular cluster, a particular cluster might need a different kind of a supplier, a different kind of financing mechanism. And what's very critical in countries like Lebanon and Nigeria, and this speaks to what, what Jonathan was uh, talking about, the community uh, aspect, you know, the community buy-in has to be very high. We worked in, uh, in Zahle in, in Lebanon, which has its own sort of sectarian complexities. In Nigeria with the SMEs, they have their own uh, political economy complexities. Community buy-in is very important, but once you get that community buy-in, once you get that willingness to pay, you can actually get in less politically connected investors. And this buy itself becomes a sort of anti-corruption program, not sort of becomes an anti-corruption strategy, because when you're improving development outcomes, which is you are uh, ensuring that uh, more elect electricity is supplied, rent capture isn't taking place, and people are able to improve productivity, by definition, by increasing efficiency, you are reducing corruption. So this becomes an effective anti-corruption uh, mechanism. This is not scale on the lines that Mushtaq talked about for the health sector, but we, as, as he you know, said in the beginning, these are early days and we are doing so much interesting research. We've been having conversations with, with Jonathan and, and uh, you know, his team of colleagues, and there are very interesting ways in, in which we can join this thinking up. And we just thought that it would be interesting to present our work on the electricity sector and how you can actually think about uh, improving outcomes, reducing corruption, through this concept of scaling, it's not on the same scale of adaptive and uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, scalable as it is in the health sector, but in the relative terms of how we think of the electricity sector, this is certainly adaptive, this is certainly very flexible. And uh, we're hoping for some very interesting questions. We're also hoping to continue this research and, and test it out in, in, uh, in Nigeria and in Lebanon, but I'm going to stop here because we started late and maybe some of you might have a few questions. So um, happy to take any questions that you might have here. Uh, let me just check the chat box. We don't have any, but we're happy to take uh, questions. So go ahead. Yes, so thank you for the presentation. It was, it was uh, really interesting and um, yes, very novel. And so I, I really look forward to um, reading more. So I'm, I'm, uh, I work at the U4 Anti-Corruption Resource Center. Um, I'm just wondering uh, around this, uh, about this question of uh, applicability and, and to where and when can we apply this framework? Um, so Pallavi has, has just mentioned about the possibilities of using it in the electricity sector, but I, I'm just wondering more generally how, to, to what extent it can be used for anti-corruption or for uh, better, less corrupt public service delivery once the emergency situation dissipates, or we move into some kind of new normal, because it seems to me that key to this framework um, are the incentives created by the situation. So the need to deliver. So that's a very strong political incentive that you need to deliver. So, um, and secondly, also um, the incentive about who you deliver to, because uh, during this, uh, the, the, the crisis, in a way, the science decides who gets what uh, or who should get what. Uh, rather than the politics. So in a way, the, the political contestation of, of public goods is voided by, by the science, of, and, and which is quite clear about who is, who is in more need than others. And um, so I'm just wondering, once you remove those two kind of bedrock incentive, incentives to need to be in, uh, efficient to get rid of, the, to get out of this situation as quickly as possible, and the clarity about who deserves what in this situation, are you not then risking the possibility of these networks just turning into kind of formalized patron client networks uh, and then a kind of return to the situation where the, the state becomes even more contested and public service delivery even more clientelistic? <laughs> 
Mushtaq, would you like to take that first? And then maybe we can go to Jonathan if he has anything to add. Yes, I think that's a, a really great point, David. I mean, I think, so we are not, there's no panacea here. I think that's the basic point. But I think what we are trying to highlight is that <clears throat> the conventional way of thinking about how to deal with clientelism and corruption has also utterly failed. Uh, so what we, th what we think that we can do, which is to enforce rules on these different actors from above by having incrementally more um, uh, rules-based strategies, reducing discretion, trying to set up rules which can be then monitored from above and enforced, doesn't work precisely because anti-corruption itself is corrupted. The very processes that you are trying to um, enforce become the subject of a further higher level round of corruption. And the anti-corruption commission becomes corrupt. The judges become corrupt. The police become corrupt. Because ultimately, what is missing in this um, traditional way of thinking is that loop is not connected. The loop is at some point, someone must have the interest in, the, in their own self-interest to begin to enforce. And we always assume that there is this loop, which is political will will connect it somehow. So ultimately, you know, there's a, there's a prime minister or someone who in there. But the problem is the prime minister also is concerned with, um, you know, using clientelism for short term benefits. And I think that isn't going to go away. So we are, we are talking about systems that are going to be structurally clientless and have structurally have weak rule of law in the foreseeable future, which, which means in the kind of policy cycle that we are thinking of, which is 10, 15 years, that's not going to change, right? So you will still have the top people doing lots of pretty bad things. And the problem is we don't have any mechanism for really constraining that. So there's a difference between making a critique, which we are all happy to make, and saying, actually, what can we do about it? And, I, and the answer there is that on, on those higher level things, the only effective answer is when society itself has many competing power centers and many competing interests, which then collectively check each other. And that is when you get a rule of law. So, so if you ask, you know, why is there a rule of law in the United States or the, or the United Kingdom, but not in Zimbabwe or Nigeria? It's not that there's absence of political will or there's absence of good rules and, and so on. The society itself doesn't have built in checks and balances to actually create that loop in the end, right? Now, so I think, so that's a long-term, you know, so we have to have a theory of change of how we get there, how we actually build up all those real checks and balances, which are not institutional checks and balances, but organizational checks and balances. And this is, this is a very important insight from the work of Douglas North and um, uh, Barry Weingast and, um, and others on limited access orders, where they say that you have to look at institutions and organizations together and that's also what we say in our work on political settlements, that institutions by themselves don't solve the problem unless the organizations, that is the agents, want those institutions to work. So that's the background. And the background is that the kinds of questions you raised are actually unsolvable. We are saying, can we make some incremental changes? Can we find some areas where the players themselves have a competitive interest in their own interest to do something which could be aligned with the public interest? And you're absolutely right, that is not in general the case. So we are looking for areas where that might be the case, okay? And those areas might be not very many, but they're not so few either. And we do ourselves a lot of um, a disservice by not going out and looking for those areas where actually you can mobilize the organizational checks and balances, which will make some of those institutions work. I think so that's the, the frame. So that's you said that, Sorry. Okay. Sorry, we're stuck. Finish. So, so, so you said, you know, the, the prime minister is concerned about um, the health. Yes, the prime minister is concerned about health. The prime minister is also concerned about lots of other areas of development. Prime ministers are hugely concerned about power supply. Governments have fallen in developing countries because power supplies have collapsed. The point is we are not giving them feasible instruments that can actually be aligned with their interest. They, they, they have an interest in creating jobs. They just don't know how to do it. And the way they do it usually doesn't create jobs. But don't they want to? They want to. What, what we are saying is that we need to help these developing countries with implementable ideas 
that can actually mobilize some of these internal checks and balances. And I agree with you, it won't be in every sector and it won't work absolutely, you won't get zero corruption. The point is to reduce this corruption in areas where it's feasible and get better development outcomes. And I think, so the bigger point that we're making is that maybe it's time to rethink the way we think about development, right? So development should not be think sort of as a kind of bureaucratic, technocratic exercise that we go and say, look, this is the way you should be delivering health or doing skills programs or delivering power. And, and if you can't implement it, it's basically because you don't have good governance. And we'll then tell you how to do the good governance. And then we'll say that what's missing is a political will. A different way of thinking about it is that these are solutions which require a lot of innovation, enterprise in those developing countries. How do we trigger that innovation? How do we coordinate that innovation by containing the corruption, but actually mobilizing some of these competitive um, activities, both between entrepreneurs and the state? And we see this in, in the kind of uh, vaccine response in Bangladesh. There was a competition actually between the private sector and the state. And I think we this is not just a pandemic limited thing. We want to trigger this post pandemic for job creation. We want to see if we can do it for power generation. And we have to get away from this idea that there is a technic technocratic fix, which will give me completely predictable outcomes with zero corruption. No, it's about managing that competition and finding systems that actually promote that adaptation and innovation with some checks and balances. It's a completely different way of thinking. So actually, what we are suggesting is highly radical, and we welcome critiques. There are lots of obvious problems with it, like, you know, how do you make sure it doesn't go out of control, which was really your question. But you make it not go out of control by actually keeping the scale appropriate, right? You restrict it to some levels of competition and scaling where the adaptation is feasible fiscally and where you can scale it up. But I think these are really important questions. I'm not going to go on for too long because I might be able to. Jonathan late. might come in because we are just yeah. about to finish. Jonathan, do you have a few quick things? Yeah, I think uh, Mushtaq laid it out well in terms of the kinds of measures you need to introduce into a process like this. The Afghanistan basic package on health services, I think, is a really interesting case to look back at and say it's kind of proof of concept in many ways that you can create very large scaling networks that cover an entire country connected firmly to a Ministry of Health in a way that does promote efficiency. Um, it met, you know, this package met its MDG goal for cutting infant and maternal mortality in half by 2015, for example, but there was constant complaints of corruption in the system. Um, but you had these really interesting moments where the Ministry of Health had to go to them and say, you know, we're not going to do curative, we're going to focus on primary health care. And there was a big battle there. And after six months of building the infrastructure for this package by bringing in NGOs and other providers, um, they were able to merge or compromise uh, to build incentives for using the same infrastructure to do curative as well, because the elites in Kabul and others wanted curative care. So there was this adaptation and compromise and trade-off happening in that system to do this work. At the same time, you had this very large scaling framework going all the way down to very local levels, creating those feedback loops and adapting to very different circumstances in Afghanistan conflict insurgent areas on one side, disaster prone on another. So this becomes potentially a case to look back at and say, what more intentionality could we have brought in on an anti-corruption focus that's doing some of these other things like resilience, like adaptation, like scale. Um, but all this to say that if these things are being done, they're just not being done in a very formal way. And there are ways to improve it if you have the right lens. And I think this framework it, it brings and introduces that lens. I have uh, put in a, a few, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of folding up housekeeping points on chat. You know, you can find us um, on, on the website if you have any more questions from this session. Please feel free to drop us a line. It's a, it's a new piece of research. We are excited about it, but we'd love to get feedback from you. We'd, we'd love to make this a conversation that keeps, keeps rolling on. But thank you again. Uh, thank you, Jonathan, especially for, for joining it. It's early for you, we know, but thank you once again. Thank you to everyone who signed on. And uh, yeah, hope to keep the conversation going. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you once thank again. Thank you. Bye-bye.